Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you live to episode number 36 of the Primetime Rundown interview series powered by StreamYard right here on the Eastern Observer and the I-95 Sports and Entertainment Network on Zingo Television Channel 198. Alongside Arizona Coyotes, Fox Sports Arizona broadcaster Matt McConnell, I'm Joey Gersnicka. We cannot thank you enough for joining us here on this Thursday evening. Matt, how are you and uh, how has quarantine treated you? You know, Joey, I'm great. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, uh, you know, quarantine's been okay. It's something that I hope we never have to go through again, if you know what I mean. But, <laughs> yeah. but overall, I think we've all tried to make the best of it. And, um, you know, the hockey was great. There weren't any fans, but uh, congratulations to the Lightning. And it's, it, I think sports heals, and it was great to see sports come back with a vengeance a couple of months ago. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And uh, and to see to see the way the uh, the NHL bubble worked, the NBA bubble worked. And yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately with uh, with some of the other sports, the NFL, the MLB, it's not really working out thus far. Uh, MLB they've finally gotten their act together, but unfortunately we're starting to see stuff in the uh, in the NFL. But um, I actually want to get into this, where um, you know a lot of the uh, episodes that we've had on here have included a lot of your colleagues, as uh, previously noted in our conversation, uh, sure. by email. And um, most people want to know who Matt McConnell is outside of the press box and how you got to where you are. And uh, and I know a, a lot of it because uh, I did watch the uh, uh, the national sports uh, sports media. Um, uh, broadcast with you and uh, right. and Weber and yeah. and also um, and the uh, and the Washington Capitals play by play man uh, Joe Beninati. So uh, that was pretty cool to uh, to hear your life story as uh, as well as your colleagues. But uh, let's hear it firsthand. And uh, you you were born in Gary, Indiana, so you are a native uh, East Coaster, if you will, or uh, Midwest slash East Eastern yeah, area. Midwest, <laughs> Midwest. Yeah, I guess so. But. Uh, so now you, uh, but you actually attended um, college prep school in Pittsburgh, uh, Mount Lebanon High School. Talk a little bit about that and uh, and how you eventually got to Michigan State. Well, first of all, and I want to go back to the NSMA uh, uh, deal that we had a couple of weeks ago. Whatever Pete Weber said on that call, don't believe a thing, okay? <laughs> don't believe any, Joe Beninati, it's okay, but don't believe a thing that Pete Weber said. Um <laughs> I, I got to Michigan State, honestly, because, I, you know, my whole family went to Indiana and I thought I was going to go to Indiana. And I had a, a 2.97 GPA in high school. I didn't get into Indiana. So um, Michigan State uh, took me. And and when I got to East Lansing, I thought I was going to be a finance major and I couldn't handle the math. So that changed quickly. And I had a, a sports writer as an uncle who, um, you know, we, we had a heart to heart one Christmas he was out of the house and he had been a sports editor for a, a paper in Gary, Indiana for a long time. And I picked his brain. I said, you know, Uncle John, I've always thought about doing what you you know, you do or or maybe not so much the, the writing side of it, but maybe getting into the broadcasting end of it. And, you know, he he took a big old long sip of his scotch and he, and he goes, <laughs> well, you know, Matt, he goes, you don't want to get 25 years down the road and look back and say, what if? Right. And that, that was kind of the, the advice and kind of my, my changing moment, if you will, early in my college career. So I went back to Michigan State. I said, you know what? I'm going to go for it. I can't get through the math, so I can't be a finance major. Um, the telecommunication program at Michigan State didn't require math. So I'm saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking to myself, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go see how far I can go with this dream of mine to do sports play-by-play, -play, and I don't have to take math. So I, I might actually get a college degree out of it, right? So that's kind of how it all went. Um, I'm a Spartan through and through. Yeah, I love my school. I met so many great people there. We put a lot of guys in the NHL as a, as a program, and we've also had some graduates back in my era get into Major League Baseball. Uh, we had an NBA broadcaster, so uh, it's not um, – it doesn't get the hype that Syracuse gets or maybe even the hype that Arizona State out here gets with the Cronkite School, but the Michigan State program is excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, and for those that are watching out here in the Long Island area or even the New York area, it really goes the same exact thing with the obviously the Fordhams of the world as well. 
Um, sure. So, but you know, clearly, again, wherever wherever you go, and even the grades that you do get, you eventually get to where you want to get to because, yeah. as you said, uh, Matt, a two point nine seven grade point average coming out of high school. That no, but you know what? And and, and also, it's not very good. No, it's not. But you know what though? But but for some of those people out there. Um, give your best advice to them, especially now, and, and we'll hop, hop uh, around um, back and forth a little bit, but your best advice to somebody who has a grade point average like that and says, I'm never going to get to the college that I want to get to or get into the position where Matt McConnell is right now, how can those people um, that are suffering through those mental challenges amid this pandemic have that mindset that they could get there? Well, you know, that, that's a great question, Joey. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I, I was never one to tell the kids to sweat the grades. Um, you know, there's an old saying, C's get degrees, right? Mm-hmm. Now, it, it's different if you're, if you're getting academic aid, right? And you have to maintain a 3.0 grade point average. That's, you know, that, 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 I get that. that. That's a game changer. So you do have to worry about the academics. But I can honestly say in, in all my years in the business, nobody, in fact, even at the beginning, nobody ever asked me about my grade point average. So, so I think the important thing for, for kids that are getting ready to go into college and they want to pursue broadcasting, I think when they get to campus as a freshman, they want to establish their academic success, right? So you, you get rolling academically, you learn about college, you learn about what it's like to live on your own. And then you once you get that M- academic foundation built, then you can go ahead, get involved in, you know, campus radio, campus television, things like that. And then you're off to the races. But C's get degrees. I, I finished, you know, I finished Michigan State with just under a 2.5, right? But I never felt threatened. So, you know, the main thing is to establish yourself academically. And then once you have that all figured out, then get into the experience aspects of your degree. Right. And that's really where it comes down to is uh, sure. is the experience and the connections that you eventually make. And you actually brought up um, about the the, uh, the campus radio stations, etc. You were actually the assistant sports director of WLFT Radio. Speak about your time there and uh, and how you became a sports writer for the state news. Well, I am. Um, you know, it's interesting, Joey, because I when I found out that I wasn't going to be a finance major, I went back to, you know, I went back to school, I changed my major officially, and then I wanted to get involved in campus radio right away. So I went to an informational, you know, an organizational meeting, right? And at the beginning, I was, um, you know, I was doing five minute sports updates at 11 o'clock on Friday and Saturday night. I'm sure this many people were listening to those sports updates back then, right? <laughs> but it, but it's where you start. Right. You know, you're not going to walk in and you're not going to call Michigan State football, and you're not going to walk in and you're not going to call Michigan State basketball. In fact, I had to wait till my spring semester, and I got one or two baseball games. So that's what we kind of did. We kind of started people off on some of the secondary sports. Baseball's not that big of a deal at Michigan State like it would be at. ASU or, you know, some of the schools down south. So that that was kind of the carrot. You know, I worked hard to to um, earn those, you know, earn those uh, assignments. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed. I did a little more in my sophomore year and a little more in my junior and senior year before, um, you know, it, it, towards the end, I had taken over Michigan State's hockey play by play. I was uh, jumping in to do uh, Michigan State basketball. I learned how to sell broadcast packages uh, when, when I was in college. So, you know, the main thing is, is you, you, you try to get a little bit of experience in a lot of different areas, because when you get out of college, you're going to, if you go work for a minor league baseball team, say, or a minor league hockey team, you're only going to do the play by play is only going to be a small part of your, your duties on that staff. You're going to do play by play. You're going to sell, you're going to hold press conferences. You're going to do the game notes. You're going to update the statistics. You're going to meet with people. You're going to go out and, and schmooze clients. It's a whole lot of different things. And and that's why I try to encourage the kids in college, not to just worry about getting all those reps in play by play, but also to get the experience in PR in sales, in marketing, take a few business classes, learn how to do a budget. Those are all critical things. And there are things that I talk about on my podcast, um, Sports Booth. And we've also taken Sports Booth to the web. So now we have sportsboothweb.com. So I encourage 
all the students to check that out for some good pointers. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And actually right on our uh, on our ticker on the bottom, we actually did put uh, Sports Booth Pod 1 on the bottom there. It, it will be right. up in just a couple of seconds uh, under the uh, under the Twitter part. Um, I love the ticker. The ticker's great, Joey. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, listen, uh, I can't I can't take credit for that. That's all StreamYard on there, but uh <laughs> But just to uh, thank you, I guess you know, just to just to write write all the stuff down, and uh, there it is, Sports Booth Pod One, right there. So for those awesome. that thank are you. on Twitter, uh, please definitely follow Matt and uh, and his journey, and um, and basically everything that all of the uh, advice that he has to, for all of us young broadcasters. Um, so now, following your time in at uh, Michigan State. 1981 to 85 then just a few years later about eight years later matt um you you became a national hockey league play-by-play broadcaster and the best part about it is is that you joined an expansion team you joined the mighty ducks of anaheim also known today as the anaheim duck (laughs) so you were the radio broadcaster for the ducks and, um, you know, just, again, to be able to get a start with a team that is starting themselves, yeah. you are literally starting on the ground floor with a brand new team. How hard was it, but also how cool was it where you would be able to get those reps with not really much history? Well, it, it, there's so many advantages of going into an expansion team, Joey, and, and you're right. You're, you're the first guy, right? You're, you're the first radio broadcaster or television broadcaster. So, you know, the fans couldn't have been nicer to me. They, they were fired up for hockey in Orange County. The Ducks, right off the start, were pretty competitive. They, they only missed the playoffs in that first year by, um, I think, two points to the Winnipeg Jets. They, they won 19 road games that year, and where they – Ironically, where they struggled was at home. So if they had been, you know, any better at home, they would have been like Vegas. They would have made the playoffs in their very first year of yeah. existence. Uh, it, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had a we had a group in Anaheim that was, you know, we were kind of like an expansion broadcast team, right? Like I was coming in from from uh, Richmond, Virginia. That's another story I got to tell. And um, the TV guy was coming in from Chicago. Our producer was in from Chicago. Brian Hayward had just uh, retired from from San Jose. Charlie Simmer, part of the Triple Crown line in the years with Marcel Dion and Dave Taylor in Los Angeles. He was my analyst. So we were all just kind of coming together and trying to, you know, become a melting pot of broadcasters, if you will. Yeah. So it was exciting. We, we did things together. We'd go over to each other's houses for dinner. We'd do cookouts. We, we hung out on the road, and, and it was, um, in so many ways, it was really a special time back then. Yeah, really, really cool stuff. And to be able, again, to feel um, almost welcomed in into a brand new family is probably the coolest thing. And especially, as you said, uh, they were nice. The, uh, the reception was good because, again, some of the folks that we have had on this podcast that have had uh, very similar um, very similar roads uh, mm-hmm. to get to where they've wanted to get to, one being which of uh, NBA's uh, Atlanta Hawks' Bob Rathbun, where he was a Detroit uh, Tigers broadcaster and was booed out of the booth and booed, <laughs> booed out of a job as well. So, um, you know, two completely different stories and obviously a real positive one on the, on the spectrum, which is fantastic for you, Matt. Um, because then in that year, then you eventually got to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Talk about that time. Yeah. You know, um, I, I always dream to do television in, in the NHL. Right. So, um, I have, you know, heavy Pittsburgh ties. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the fact that I went to Mount Lebanon high school, my wife is from suburban Pittsburgh. She was born in the city. Her family is uh, just south of Pittsburgh. So there are lots of reasons and, and really a lot of incentives for me to go back. It was, um, you know, it was a chance for us to kind of go home, if you will. But mainly uh, that Pittsburgh job, it was a radio job with the Penguins, but they allowed me to do about 10 television games a year. So I figured, OK, I'll go to Pittsburgh. I'll gain some television experience and hopefully parlay that into a full-time television job, which I did a few years later down in Atlanta. But but Pittsburgh was fun. I mean, you know, back then, you know, Mary, you had Mario Lemieux, Yarmir Yager, you had Tom Barrasso, Darius Kasparaitis, you had, you know, Ronnie Francis, who's now the GM up in Seattle. You had a, you had an unbelievable 
group of players, not all that far removed from a Stanley Cup, by the way. Yes. So, um, it, you know, it, it was just it, it was it was neat. It was fun. Um, being able to do those television games was really a turning point in my career. And, um, you know, I, I, to this day, you know, we go back to Pittsburgh and, you know, people will still, you know, outside the hotel, they'll still say, Hey Matt, how you doing? You know, it's Pittsburgh is a great sports city and it is just a, they were, they were so welcoming at the time. I, I love that place. Yeah. Pittsburgh. And especially again, as you said, you know, you're, you're going home, which is, uh, which is really a cool thing again. Sure. Uh, and I'm, sh and I'm assuming that, and you know what, we'll actually, uh, switch, switch topics for just one second. Um, you obviously have your sports booth podcast and you uh, you educate some younger broadcasters. And this is a question that so many people have, not only for myself, and I've gotten even from uh, when I was a sports uh, sports director at St. John's, some young, young kids would ask me, do you really have to go far away to eventually come back to New York? And I didn't really have an answer. So I'd love to hear your answer with that. Um, if you have to go to a small city to eventually – head back home. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know if all roads, Joey, lead back home. Um, not, you know, in my case, you know, for three years it, it did. Uh, but I had moved around so many times growing up. My, my father worked for a steel company. So that's how we ended up in Pittsburgh when I was a sophomore in high school. I, I think as a young broadcaster, you got to realize that you're not starting in New York. You're not starting in Chicago. You're not starting in LA. You're not starting in Dallas, right? You're, right. you're probably starting in Missoula, Montana, Davenport, Iowa, Bismarck, North Dakota. And that's okay um, because in those markets, you're going to have an opportunity to get lots of experience in a lot of different areas, and you're going to have a, a chance to, to take chances. Now, on the Sports Booth web update today, I, uh, under, in the blog section, I, I, I talked about that, about, about young broadcasters not being afraid to take chances along the way. And I talked about some of the different things we did when I was with the Atlanta Thrashers. Uh, we had an EP down there by the name of Mike Pearl, who, you know, he, he challenged us to take chances and try different things. And so, you know, when you're in smaller markets as a young broadcaster, man or woman, you have an opportunity, of course, within reason to try different things to, you know, maybe your opens a little bit different. Maybe you go uh, about a different way of interviewing people. Maybe, you know, maybe you do a game from the stands. We actually did that in Atlanta with the Thrashers. So, um, so, so to, to, to kind of answer your question, I, I think as a young broadcaster, you got to be prepared to go pretty much anywhere, wherever the opportunity uh, is knocking, you, you got to go and you got to chase it. And, you know, the other thing, too, is you're young, right? So why not take five, 10 years and, and commit that to trying to come up through the ranks? But you will start in a smaller market, uh, you know, 90, 99 percent of the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, and, and clearly also, again, it, it's it's firsthand with you as well, because, again, you went from Pittsburgh, you went to Michigan State with school, and then eventually then you went all the way across the country uh, to Anaheim. You came back to the east uh, to the east uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, came home, if you will. And then following that, as you brought up earlier, uh, from 99 to 2003. Um, let's not forget the, uh, the then Atlanta Thrashers, you were the TV broadcaster for. So. Um, we all know how that how that how that fate occurred. Um, but yeah. let's hear. But you know what? Uh, listen, regardless of that happening, you were still the television broadcaster of a National Hockey League team. Talk about getting that job and uh, and just feeling the the gratefulness of getting a TV gig. Well, you know, I, in my days in the IHL, I got to know Don Waddell, who's the president of the Carolina Hurricanes now, and he was the general manager in Atlanta. And there was one night when I was in Pittsburgh, we were, we were down in, in Tampa Bay for a game, and he, he'd always stop by the booth, you know, when, when he'd be scouting for Atlanta on the road, because he, he was hired a year ahead of the franchise, right? Yeah. So um, he comes into the booth, and, and we're talking, and, and he leaves. And then I said to myself, geez, go back and ask them, what are their plans for, for television, right? What are their plans for the broadcaster? So I, I go back down and I, you know, I had a real nice conversation with him. And he said, you know, get me your stuff. Uh, I'll make sure that, um, you know, you're in the pile that, you know, gets, gets you know, the, a good amount of consideration. No promises or anything like that. So I, so I sent him my stuff. And then the next thing I know, 
uh, a few months later, I'm getting a call from from Turner Sports, right? So uh, it, it was great. It, it, the, the thing about Atlanta is it's a big event town when it comes to sports. You know, they've they've had the World Series there with the Atlanta They've had Super Bowls. They've had Final Fours, right? They they've had uh, they've you know, they, they they've had the huge um, they, they've had the huge games in terms of college football as well. So, um, so when the Thrashers got there, it was a new thing and they were really popular and the team was terrible and they were selling out games, but after the novelty wore off and the team was actually getting better, the crowd started to go down, but it was great. Living in Atlanta was fun. My family loved it. Uh, Atlanta is affordable. You can buy a lot of house down there. The weather is great. Uh, you don't have much of a winter in Atlanta. So, uh, we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And, um, you know, just being able to work for Turner Sports was was pretty cool. Yeah, it really is, and especially to be able to um, to be able to get a phone call from Turner Sports and to be able to uh, call, call then call games for the NBA, which is really cool too. Um, you were a fill-in play-by-play broadcaster for uh, for NBA on TNT. You also in that in that time span as well, Matt. You were um, you were a play-by-play man for uh, Westwood One. Um, and for NHL radio, which is really cool as well. Um, then eventually you were the co-host of Thrash Talk. We got that as well. And then you were also a sideline reporter for the Stanley Cup Finals uh, and also for the All-Star Game at ESPN. So now things are slowly becoming to um, mount in terms of the, uh, the, the number of gigs that you have. Now there's – I just read – I think it was the you – know, I think I, I read four, four or five things here. And really cool stuff. But now, you know, you're looking for that job. You finally get it. But now the opportunities are calling. And how are you able to handle all of those gigs? Well, you, you know, that, that's a big part of, of the learning process is, is learning how to network. And, you know, full disclosure, the NBA gig was, was a one and done, right? So, so the, the way that worked was we were in Toronto and we had played the Maple Leafs, the Thrashers, and we couldn't get out of the city because we had a, a mechanical issue with our plane. So we stayed overnight. And that night in Toronto, the Raptors and Nuggets were playing on TNT, and Marv Albert was supposed to call the game, and he couldn't get into New York because of weather. And plus, he had called a triple overtime Knicks game the night before, and he was starting to lose his voice. So I get this call in my hotel room saying, Hey, um, have you ever done NBA? Have you ever, or have you ever done basketball? And I, you know, I said, yeah, I've done some college hoops a little bit here and there, which I had done about this much. <laughs> and the next thing they say to me is, do you want to fill in for Marv tonight and do the game in Toronto? And I'm like, you're kidding, right? And, no, no, we're, you're, we're not kidding. We're in a bind. We need you to call that game. So, so that's kind of how that unfolded. But um, yeah, I, 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 think, um, I think as you get further along in the industry and you have more and more opportunities to meet people and those people have more and more of an opportunity to see what kind of a job you can do and your work ethic and your personality and all things like that, it, 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 it really helps you in terms of maybe being top of mind when there's an opening or where there's a time when they need somebody. Give you another example. Um, in 2009, I was freelancing for CBS Sports Network, and the NHL Network was just starting their World Junior coverage of Team USA games. And the tournament, the World Junior tournament, was up in Ottawa, and they needed a play-by-play guy, right? So Lisa Seltzer, who was producing that 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 series up in Ottawa, was my old producer from Anaheim. Oh my goodness. So she calls, you know, she calls and says, Hey, would you, would you be interested in doing play by play? You know, do you have the time? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I could fit that in. So, you know, things like that happen. Um, you, you just never know. Uh, same type of thing with CBS when they were looking for a college hockey broadcaster in 05, uh, their, their executive producer reached out to Lisa because Lisa knows everybody. And Lisa said, well, I got a guy for you. His name's Matt McConnell. So, so I, you know, I, that's what I try to tell the kids. You never know when that opportunity is going to happen or when somebody's going to recommend you, but when it happens, it moves really fast. So you got to be ready with your demo reel. You've got to be ready with your updated resume. You've got to be ready to take an interview. You just never know. And that's why, 
That's why in this business, you work hard. You try to be, um, you try to do as best as you can. Uh, you try, you never burn a bridge, right? Oh yeah. You, and, and you network like crazy to get to know as many people as possible. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and not only that too, this is something that, uh, that we've continuously heard over and over again when I was in school. And again, another question for you is, uh, is that now you, you bring up about, um, burning bridges and things like that. But yeah. I've heard the, the saying of is that if you only ask for a job to those people, you come off as extremely selfish. And why should we help you when really you can ask for advice? You can speak to them. You don't have to be fake. You can really get to know them and really want to befriend them or try and get to know them as human beings. What is your stance on that as a professional who I'm sure tons of people have come to you and asked you for a lot of things. And it's very difficult for a lot of those people. Well, that's, that's a great point, Joey. I, I think a lot of times less is more. I think a lot of times as well, when you're trying to chase things, they, they never materialize. But when you least expect it, then all of a sudden you have a chance here, here, and here. You know what I mean? So, so I think it's important to be um, respectful I think it's really important to reach out and, and ask for advice, ask for feedback. I'll give you an example. There, there have been a couple of kids, uh, students at, at Arizona State that I've gotten to know who I think are very good play-by-play -play broadcasters that have an opportunity, I believe, at the next level. Now, um, they, they have successfully created a warm market with myself, right? Um, it's not just ASU. It's 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 kids at Michigan State. It's 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 students around the country that have um, that have reached out. Now I've talked to students, and I've been on Zoom calls, and I've been in person speaking to classes where kids are just looking around and they're checking their watches and they're looking down at their phone and everything else. And I would never I would never recommend them because to me they're they're disinterested. But there's always two or three kids in those classes on those Zoom calls that take advantage and, and you know, in a way, try to make an impression, but, but really try to soak up the advice and the information from somebody that's been doing it for more than 25 years. I'll give you another story. I was getting ready to do a women's soccer tournament at ASU for Pac-12 Networks. And one of the cool things with Pac-12 Networks is Whenever they go to campus to do one of the Olympic sporting events uh, or one of the Olympic sports, they always have a sign-up sheet for kids in the program that can, like, sign up to work on the crew, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if they volunteer or get paid, or, but, but that's beside the point. They get the experience, right? So this one event, there had been a young lady who had signed up to work on the crew. And so she got assigned to a camera operator. So the camera operator takes her aside and it's, you know, a couple hours before the game and says, okay, um, let me tell you about the camera. Uh, this is a P2 camera. This is how you turn it on, turn it off. These are the levels that I have to check to, you know, before we go on the air to make sure everything's okay. This is how you put it up on your, on your shoulder and blah. And she's standing there and she's got her arms crossed and, and she's looking at him. And, and finally she says, why are you showing me all this? And the, ca the, the camera guy is like, well, I'm showing you this because, you know, this, these are things that you're going to have to know to operate camera. And she looks at him and says, well, I'm never going to, I'm never going to be a camera operator. I don't want to do that. Do you think she ever worked on another show? Never. <laughs> no. It, so, so there's, there's a certain way to be smart and there's a certain way, and there's, there's a way to being just, just utterly stupid when it comes to an opportunity you know, maybe that wasn't her goal to run camera, right? But she runs camera, she learns that. Maybe one day she gets to direct a little bit. Another day she's the producer for an event. Maybe she does play-by-play. -play. Maybe she's an analyst. You know, there's, there's all different things that she could do and gain experience from. But now, based on that incident, I'd be very surprised if she's going to get another opportunity in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Would have to be a uh, a massive apology, or even uh, or even attitude change, body language, all of the above, to really get that second opportunity. And also, trust comes into it as well, because if we give you absolutely. that opportunity, 
uh, do we really trust that you're going to uh, stay there the whole time or keep your arms crossed? Yeah. That is some big stuff there. Um, so let's go back if, uh, if we, cause we do have a, a, about 15 more minutes here. Sure. Uh, Matt, I, I want to know about your, uh, your Richmond story. Give us a little bit about, about what you were going to say earlier. Cause I felt like I interrupted you. I apologize. All right. So I'm working in Peoria, right? Yeah. And it's 1992, 93. And who's coming into the NHL? The mighty ducks and the Florida Panthers. Yeah. So what do I do? I send out my stuff, right? I, you know, I didn't have a connection at either place. My dad didn't know the, the CEO of either company running the team, you know, none of that. I just blindly send my stuff. So I send my stuff on a Monday and I, I kid you not, I think by Friday, the Florida Panthers had sent me back the rejection letter, right? So it's like, no, you're not coming to Florida. But I went, but, but like, I never heard anything back from the docs, right? So a week goes by, a month goes by. Two months go by, I hear nothing from them. So I'm thinking, you know what? I got no shot. The dream's over. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to leave Peoria. I have a chance to go to Richmond in the East Coast Hockey League and become the assistant general manager and run the business side. So at this point in time, I'm in a serious relationship with, with my wife. And I'm thinking, you know, I'll learn the business side. I'll work for a team. I'll settle down. I, I gave the play-by-play -play a good run, but it's just not going to work out. So I take the job in Richmond. And I'm there for about a month, month and a half, and I am hating it. I'm working for, I'm the assistant general manager and the GM of the team uh, who's running the business side or the president, if you want to call him that. He is, um, he and I didn't really see eye to eye on ideas. Uh, we would get together at a local pub, say on a Wednesday night, we'd go over different things with, you know, concerning the staff, we'd have some ideas and, you know, I'd say, hey, what do you think if we did this? And he's like, that's a great idea. Why don't you bring it up in the staff meeting on, on Friday? Okay, no problem. Yeah. So we get, in, we get into the staff meeting and I'd say, hey, um, you know, I bring up the idea. And right in the middle of me talking to the staff, he'd say, you know what, Matt, I, I, over the weekend I thought about that idea. That, that, you know, that, I don't, I, we're not going to do that. Like right in front of everybody. I mean, the guy, the guy was an idiot, okay? Yeah, that's wrong. Um, so, so I come home one night to my, my uh, townhouse. And if you know anything about Richmond, in the middle of summer, it's – it is 100 degrees every day, yeah, and the agree. relative humidity is like 750%. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Richmond is the one place. It's a beautiful city, but it's the one place where you could take four showers a day in the, in, in the summer. It's that <laughs> hot and humid. So I get home, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pissed off, and, I, and the job's not going well, and I'm thinking, what did I do? Why did I leave Peoria? And I look over, and I see my answering machine light flickering. And that's back in answering machine days, right? No, none of these, none that's of these. Right, phones yep. So, so I end up going over there. And I'm like, "Who the heck is this?" And I, I hit the button to play the message, and I hear, I hear, "Hi, this is, um, this is Susan Jackson from Tony Tavares's office at the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim. Can you please call us?" Wow. And, and so, so I write down the phone number. This, this, this true story. I write down the phone number, and it's a 714 area code. That's Orange County, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking my first reaction, Joey, I kid you not, was who's, which, which friend of mine put his girlfriend <laughs> up to calling my answering machine and playing the worst practical joke ever known to man? So I literally went to the yellow or the white pages, you know, the old phone books. We don't yeah. use those yeah. anymore. And I, 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 I confirmed that 714 was Orange County. Wow. So I get on the phone and sure enough, she answers the phone, Susan Jackson. And she puts me right through, through to Tony Tavares, who was running the, the team. And Tony was a straight shooter. Like, he, you know, he, he's like to the point, all business. He's like, hey, man, thanks for calling us back. You still a candidate for our uh, radio play-by-play -play job? And I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's like, when can you come out here? We want to talk to you. So that was a Wednesday night. I got on a plane Friday morning. I got out there at about 10 o'clock. I did a whole gauntlet of, of a series of interviews all day long. And at the very end, I met with Tony. 
And Tony said, what are you going to need here? You know, what, what are you going to need if we hire you in terms of money? And I threw out a figure and he kind of looked at me and he's like, you're going to need more than that. This is Southern California kid. It's not cheap here. So, so he was very fair. And, and I said, does that mean I got the job? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the job, but you got to be back here a week from Monday. And that's how it happened. Wow. So, so I go back, I go back to Richmond and it's Monday now. And I go back to Richmond and I walk in the office at about eight, eight thirty, And I see the, I see the president. I'm like, Hey, um, there's something came up really important. I got to talk to you. And he's like, I can't talk to you right now. Um, why, why don't we talk around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock? He goes, I'm, I'm loaded up. And I go, no, I, I got to talk to you now. He goes, I, I, I can't. I go, I need to talk now. And I walked into his office and we closed the door and I said, hey, I have to resign because I just got the radio play-by-play -play job for the mighty ducks of Anaheim. And he just, I'll never forget, he just sat there for about five seconds and went <laughs> like that. And so I was out of there. Um, you know, it was it was kind of a tough situation, but it, but it was an opportunity to learn the business side. So so, anyways, that that that's my story. And and I would have never gotten that job had it not been for Jim Jackson, the longtime TV voice of the Philadelphia Flyers, turning the Ducks down. The, the, Jim and I laugh about this story all the time. Jim was on the phone getting offered the Anaheim Ducks job when his call waiting clicked in and it was the Flyers offering him the job wow. with the Flyers. So, so, you know, Jim ended up going to Philly and I was kind of their second choice. I didn't care. And, um, and it worked out great. It was, but, but yeah, that's my, that was my Richmond story. The, the humidity, the pain, and then the uh, the you know elation, I guess. <laughs> it, 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 it's amazing though, because again, a month a month later, you're into the job, and you get the phone call, and really that was something that you were not expecting. So yeah. really, really cool. And then eventually, just to fast forward a little bit, again with freelancing, being able to to work for the Pac-12 Network since 2012. Um, following the departure of the Atlanta Thrashers heading back home to Winnipeg or heading to Winnipeg, if you will, the second coming of the Jets. Um, now, before before we get to where you are currently, the Atlanta Thrashers, obviously, once that time expired uh, down south, what did that feel like for you when, I guess, the that would be you were not a part of the, the plans to head up, head up north? Um, I don't know how it would work anyway with – Fox Sports South and then moved to TSN. But regardless of how it was, is that, you know, your time involuntarily came to a close. Well, I had I had one conversation with Mark Chipman, who's the, the, the head of the Winnipeg Jets, and he couldn't have been nicer, or more gracious. Um, you know, and I, I told him, I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm available if you need me. I certainly know the franchise. I'm not going to move to Winnipeg. You know, I would commute out of Atlanta. But, but the, the fact of the matter is, Joey, is it's very hard for Americans to work in Canada, right? Yeah. And I never thought that they would, you know, bring me along. They actually brought the, um, the radio broadcaster, Dan Kamal. He, he, went, he reported on Jets games in that first year. They traveled them around city to city in the U.S., and he kind of became their, their radio reporter on, on, on the radio side. So that was great for Dan. Yeah. But, but I knew I didn't have a, a, a realistic opportunity there. They had a, a full bullpen of people from T, uh, uh, for TSN. I was actually set before, before the Coyotes uh, situation happened. I was going to stay in Atlanta and do Southern Conference football and basketball. And it, it, it was, it, it, at best, it was a stopgap for me. It was yeah. a chance to kind of continue along and play by play, but it was only one game a week. And, you know, when you're only doing one, you know, when you're doing a game of the week, that's unless you're Al Michaels or you're, you know, Jack Ball or, you know, uh, Joe Buck, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to do a situation like that. So, um, so, so I was, I was scrambling a little bit. I, I was wondering what I was going to do. I, um, you know, financially, I was fine. I, I, I wasn't worried too much about that. I think I would have been a lot more concerned had I been younger at the time. But, you know, I think experience kind of, um, you know, settles everything down, if you will, yeah. over time. You, you know, you, you're just going through experiences of 
losing a team or a team moving, things like that. So, um, so overall, I thought um, I thought it all worked out fine. But uh, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's great to be in Arizona, and it's been a great stop along the way. Yeah, exactly. And to be able to uh, get to Arizona, to be able to take over for a legend in the late great Dave Strader, let's let's actually discuss that and how you got to Arizona. Let's hear this. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is I, I, I tend to be kind of one of the last guys in the room to know what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so here I am concentrating on doing the Southern Conference football basketball package, and I'm getting ready in my mind to, to do that. And I hadn't realized for a few days that, that Dave Strader had left to go to NBC, right? And so I get a text out of the clear, or I get a voicemail out of the out of the clear blue from the legendary Jiggs McDonald of New York Islanders fame, right? One of the greatest play-by-play broadcasters ever to throw on the headset or be behind the mic. I mean, Jiggs is a legend. Yes, he is. And and I got to know Jiggs when I was in Peoria. I had him on my show. He knew who I was. He had heard my stuff. And, and we became friends through the circuit. And he, go, he, he said, Matt, he goes, I'm sure you've heard this. Uh, demonstrators leave in Arizona to go to uh, NBC. And I'm like, no, I didn't know that. I had no idea, right? So um, so so I reached out to um, I reached out to Strades and I you know I congratulated them and everything and you know we started texting back and forth and I said, hey, I, I, I gotta ask you. I know I just congratulated you, but I, I do have to ask you who who are they replacing you with in Arizona? Is there should I, you know, maybe throw my hat in the ring? And Strade said, um, I've already brought your name up to the Coyotes. I think you'd be great. And so one thing led to another. I got a call from the vice president of PR and broadcasting, a guy by the name of Rich Nairn. And um, we talked and I commuted for the first two years because the Coyotes were still going through that bankruptcy phase. Yes. And then once the, the new ownership took over, we moved the entire family out here to Scottsdale. And, um, and, you know, we haven't looked back since. So, uh, again, you just never know, you know, you're, you know, here I am, you know, figuring I'm going to do football and basketball. And then all of a sudden something opens up. So, you know, along the way you, you have to make decisions and you have to make decisions on the fly. So you really have to know what, I, I guess in a way you have to know what your ultimate goal is. Mine was hockey play by play. So, um, you know, as a young kid, your goal might be a little bit different. Maybe you don't, you know, maybe you want to do sideline. Maybe you maybe you only want to do a certain sport play by play. But I think I think you have to be open minded. And, you know, for me to transition from one NHL team to another was, you know, pretty much a no brainer. Absolutely. And not only that, you also have um, the experience in in almost every sport that we could think of, again, with with your freelance opportunity, uh, with your freelance gig with Pac-12 networks, men's and women's basketball, football, baseball, soccer, softball, um, and then at, you know from 2010 to uh, or 2007 to 2010, you were also a sideline reporter and host for the NCAA Lacrosse Championship. So again, to be able to to uh, to get all of that experience, you really have a lot um, under your belt. And God forbid if something were to ever happen, you do have the experience in all of those aforementioned sports, which is great. Well, and, and the, the lacrosse was a lot of fun. And that was, you know, that was under the CBS sports network umbrella. You yeah. know, the funny, funny thing about lacrosse doing sideline it, 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 you know, I, I tell the kids all the time, don't just be a play by play person, do other things, right. Kind of like the, the lady that was, you know, trying to not wanting to operate the camera, right. you know, try different things, you know, um, try audio, everything in the truck, try it in college. You have the opportunity to do that. The lacrosse was fun because, you know, it was division two, II, division three, uh, ESPN and Sean McDonough, they, they were doing the division one games. Uh, so we had D two, D three, and it's laid back. And, you know, those coaches and players are just happy to be getting the coverage. So they'll, they'll answer all your questions all day long. Right. And, and one of the cool things I found out is during timeouts, you can go right into the huddle. So, so I'm kind of hanging out of the huddle and I, you know, my, my producer's talking to me through my IFB and he's like, Hey Maddie, you know, you can get right into the huddle and, and, 
and you know and use that stuff to report so sure enough like i was i was like right in lemoyne's huddle i was right in suny Cortland's huddle i was you know i was i was right in uh, cw post and you know all those schools and yeah and, and and i'm right in the huddle and so you know after that dave ryan who was doing play-by-play is like let's go down to the sidelines you know, let's uh, Matt, what, you know, what was Lemoyne talking about that in that, you know, in that time on them. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about slides and I'm talking about long sticks and all this. And, and, I, you know, I, I love lacrosse, but it is certainly not my expertise. Right. And yeah. so I'm just, I'm just trying to use all this terminology. Well, I was just in the huddle and they were talking about that. They got to be better on their slides in front of their, their goal tent and you know, all this different stuff. And, uh, yeah. and I'm just, I'm just pulling it out of, out of thin air. And, but it was so much fun. And, um, you know, it, it, it was, it was cool. And I, and I, I, I had a, a chance to do a little play by play with Evan Washburn, who oh, yeah. you know, has gone on to, to be a star at CBS. Evan is just terrific on the sidelines. So, um, you know, just, just the different experiences. That's, that's how you build your resume, and that's how you create additional opportunities. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Matt, do we have time for like two or three more questions, if that's okay yeah. with you? Yeah, absolutely. All right, great, cool. So, um, so just to actually head back over to the Arizona Coyotes, and, um, you know, again, amazing to be taking over for a legend in the late, great uh, Dave Strader. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, as, as you were mentioning earlier about the bankruptcy phase and uh, the post-Ilya Brizgalov days, uh, you know, it, it's it, – or the, the post-Shane Doan days as well. Yeah. Uh, there were a few dismal years in Arizona. Yes, we you know we know that. And now we're finally here. Uh, Phil Kessel, Derek Stepan, Oliver Ekman, Larson, etc. Um, but again, the long road to obtaining this gig really cool. Um, now the biggest question here is is that when you hear in, I guess in talks or in articles or anything along those lines, uh, that this franchise could potentially relocate. Um, what is what is your thought, especially after you worked for a team that relocated to Winnipeg? Well, I, I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, I know it's not going to happen. And, and the, the new ownership, you know, the, the Alex Morello, uh, he is a billionaire. So yeah. so finances are no longer any kind of an issue here in Arizona. Alex's uh, background is he owns uh, three or four casinos between Vegas and Tahoe in Reno. He uh, he's a land development guy. He owns uh, uh, restaurants, food services. He he is a well, you know, a, a well diversified businessman that has done unbelievably well. So so that's not an issue anymore. Um, you know, there's no question that you know you would think that the the arena situation needs to be resolved. Uh, are they going to be in Glendale long term, or are they going to build a new facility? towards the East Valley. It's, um, you know, Glendale's out West. So it's, it's, it's hard to get out there for a weeknight game. If you live in the East Valley, it'd be like a person on Long Island, uh, living on Long Island, going to a devil's game on a Tuesday night. Right. It's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, maybe not quite that bad. Like there are no tunnels or bridges, but, but it, right. it, it can take an hour or two to get out there from Chandler and Mesa and some of the places, uh, in the East part of the Valley. So, um, no, it, it's been a great experience. I, um, I, you know, they made the long playoff run my first year in 2012. They, uh, they've done a really good job. I, I think we're all fired up for Bill Armstrong, the, the new general manager. It's going to be a couple of uh, huge weeks really here because now we've got the draft coming up. We've got free agency uh, a little bit later on, uh, eight days from when we are uh, uh, taping this. So uh, it's going to be crazy. You know, the, the NHL just came off the, the, great, uh, the great success in the bubble. Hopefully we're going to have fans back in the stands. So I think it's a good time. I think it's a great time for the league. They should certainly be commended for what they did to pull off the playoffs. And I think it's a good time for the Coyotes right now, too, because, um, you know, we've, got a, we've finally got a good core group of players that I think can move this thing forward. Yeah, that would be that would be something to 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 get the Arizona Coyotes back in the playoffs and uh, and to have to do it again for a uh, second year in a row. Hopefully, that would be uh, that would definitely be really cool. But now, um, amid the whole COVID nineteen pandemic, Matt, and uh, now obviously you're home, um, and on top of it too, the Coyotes went out went up to Edmonton. You were calling games. 
um, not in the bubble. You were actually calling it on a monitor. So now, my biggest question here as an aspiring play-by-play -play broadcaster and to those young, uh, young broadcasters or journalists out there, how difficult is it to call a game off a monitor um, when not only they're 1,500 miles north, but just to be able to get the proper camera angle well, you know what? You got to adapt. As a play by play person or anybody in this business, Joey, you've got to be able to adapt. And I think, um, I think you can look at it two ways. You can say, man, it, it, this is going to be, you know, th this is really hard. You know, uh, how are we going to call games off monitors from a game that's 1,500 miles away? And, or you could say, hey, you know, considering all the circumstances, considering the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and we get to call games, this is great. And that, that was kind of the, the approach that I tried to take. Um, we actually called the games off the arena scoreboard. So we had the, we had the building raise the board up uh, to, you know, kind of almost at press level. And then we took the world feed and had them put that right onto our arena scoreboard uh, through, a, through the, the TV production truck that was parked outside. We had an ISO camera we had a, a lock off camera that we could use for uh, promos and things like that. And then they also gave us from Edmonton, they gave us a camera called the All 12. It was a wide view where you could see all 12 players on the ice, but it, it, it was not a camera that you could do play by play off of because right. it was just way too wide. It, you know, they looked like ants down, but it, <laughs> but it, helped, it, it, it helped my, um, it helped my partner because he could see, plays developing and things like that. So, so we made the most of it. We lost transmission during, I want to say the first game of the Nashville series. Uh, so we lost transmission for about five, five minutes or so, but they were able to regain that uh, through the woodlands down in Houston where all our transmission goes through. So um, except for that, you know, it was pretty good. The drawbacks though are you're not there you're, you're talking to players, only a couple on, you know, via Zoom. So you can't walk around the room and talk to guys. Uh, you really didn't have the one-offs with the coaches right. that you normally had. You'd be on a, a Zoom call with everybody else. Uh, it, it, was, it was tough that way and just not being around it. Um, we are in a rapport business. So the more the players see you, see your face – um, the more comfortable they get with you. Right. Uh, so, you know, like, like when I, after practice, I'll go into a room and I might talk to six or seven guys. And a lot of times it might just be general stuff. We might be talking about our families and then we get into the game, right? Or we get into, you know, what you need to do tonight against the Maple Leafs or the Edmonton Oilers or whatever. Uh, that really wasn't available. So, um, for the for the circumstances and the situation that we were in, I thought I thought we pulled it off remarkable remarkably well. But is it something that I would like to do? Uh, you know, in the future, no. I mean, we're storytellers. We need to be there, and hopefully, when the pandemic is over, we'll be back in the arenas. Yeah, fingers crossed there, Matt. Because yeah. uh, you know, it's it's really wild to see. Uh, the way the way things are going now, thankfully, again, uh, we do have football uh, broadcasters in the in the in the booth. So hopefully that can, uh, you know, ha you know, be with hockey and basketball as well when uh, when the arena sports uh, do. Well, come back and we'll see. Yeah. And I, and I do think, I, Joey, I think there could be a possibility that since since the levels are different in different parts of the country. Yep. I, I could, and none of this has been determined. We have no idea. I don't think the league knows yet, but I do think that, that, you know, hopefully maybe it's a phased in attendance approach yeah. uh, where you start out low and you continually build based on the numbers. And maybe, you know, maybe some teams start with no fans because their numbers aren't where they need to be. And other arenas have a, a limited number of fans, kind of like the NFL right now. Right. Yeah. So, um, so it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see in that regard. And, um, you know, football is a little bit different because it's outdoors. Yeah. You know, number one, you want to make sure you have the health and safety, you know, front and center of your fans. And, and with the advances in rapid testing, uh, you know, things like that, I am hopeful 
not to mention the vaccine uh, uh, and how we progressed on, on getting a vaccine, I am very hopeful that sometime around Christmas, maybe, just maybe, fingers crossed, we're going to be in a position where we can uh, start to open up a little bit and invite fans back. I think that's what we're all hoping for. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. As you said, we are all storytellers and uh, we, we interact with, uh, with other humans. And, and that is, I think, the biggest thing uh, that is happening right now. And that's actually the perfect segue into the final question, uh, Matt, is, is that during these uncertain and rough times, I know I did ask something very similar now, or actually I asked in, in the, or on the top, at the top of the hour, um, about the rough times and the mental health of some broadcasters and, uh, and some aspiring young broadcasters on how they can keep moving forward. Now, um, we've heard there's been a lot of mental health developments in terms of um, increased depression, increased suicidal thoughts. Uh, and for those that say that, you know, we can't pass school, uh, but also for those that are out of college, or in college, we can't get those grades. We'll never get that uh, that play-by-play -play opportunity that we were once able to because people are now looking to subtract and not add. Uh, and also, even some that we've heard, um, some radio broadcasts now have been removed or vice versa, where now it's a TV broadcast simulcast on radio or, as we said, vice versa. So what would be your advice, again, as a play-by-play -play man and a professional one, a veteran who's been in the business for the last 25, almost 30 years, um, what do you tell those that, that are almost, you know, head deep in, in the couch saying, I'm never going to do this? Well, you know, contraction certainly increases the amount of competition just in a, in a, in a sure numbers game, right? And we're seeing that in minor league baseball. Uh, you know, the contraction there, I, I just uh, read something the other day that the Appalachian League, which is a, a good starting point uh, for kids out of college, they're, they're no longer going to be affiliated with Major League Baseball, and it's going to be a wooden bat league similar to Cape Cod. Well, that doesn't necessarily change the opportunity. As long as that team is still going or there is a team there, there is an opportunity, right? So, so what I would say is I, I would say there are things that you can control, Joey, and there are things that you can't control. Uh, you can't control sending your stuff to a team and then not liking it yet turning around and sending it a month later to somebody else and they love it. You can't control, you know, uh, personal uh, opinion on, on things like that. What you can control is you can control your work ethic. You can control your, um, your, your ability to do games. You can control uh, how to gain reps. There, there's, a, there's an episode on the Sports Boot podcast uh, called Having a COVID Plan. You know what's great? When I was going to school, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have video. We had, we had audio cassette recorders. If you can't do a game in, in, in COVID, and maybe you were set to do college football games for your, for your school, and that is gone, you can always turn on an NBA game, an NFL game. You can go, you can go to the web and download roster sheets. You can, you can, you know, you can put it right into your phone, right? You can, you can do all that. You, you know, if you have an iPad, if you have, if you have FaceTime, anything like that. So you can do that on your own. It's also a really good time, I think, to broaden your portfolio, if you will. Yeah. So you're not you're not necessarily calling games, but but you know maybe you can get that experience of doing game notes and updating stats by going over and knocking on the door at the sports information department and saying, "Hey, I'm a broadcast major. I know I need this experience." Can I just for the next month help out? I don't care. I'll uh, I'll run copies. I'll I'll assist. You know, setting up interviews with the student athletes. Anything, right? What about sales? You know, maybe there's an opportunity to join an organization on campus where you can gain some sales experience or you can gain public relations experience. One year at Michigan State, I was I was. Uh, I was chairperson of the MSU homecoming committee for the residence halls. So I had to coordinate all of the homecoming activities within the residence halls themselves. So that gave me, that gave me management experience, right. Yeah. Of, of handling a project and, and to be able to do all of these things 
uh, outside the broadcast booth will really help you put it together on your resume so that when you go apply to the um, the Missoula the Missoula Osprey or whatever they're called now, or, or you go to apply to the Orem Owls, you can say, hey, I can do play-by-play. -play. I've got sales experience. I've done PR. You can do it all. So, so don't let COVID get you down. Experience other areas. You know, get experience in other areas that will help make you more rounded and put you ahead of the, the person that's in line for play-by-play -play that only knows how to do play-by-play. -play. It's a numbers game. Yeah, absolutely. It really uh, – it's not only, as you said, it's a numbers game, but it's also – so difficult, you know, out there right now with teams and colleges and whatever, not having the funds to be able to pay. But as Matt did say just now, there are opportunities everywhere. You just got to go go and grab it. And uh, and even if it's outside of your comfort zone, get out of your comfort zone and go do it. Absolutely. And that and that issue or that uh, episode, Joey, on Sports Booth, uh, having a COVID plan, it's about 30, 35 minutes long. Uh, I highly recommend if you're down a little bit and you're thinking, geez, I'm never going to get a play by play job. It can it can change like that. And the having a covid plan uh, uh, episode will get you. It'll give you ideas to work on other things besides play by play to really take advantage of this downtime. Matt, where can we find uh, Sports Booth Pod One aside from Twitter? Everywhere. Um, you can find uh, the Sports Booth podcast is on Apple. It's on, you know, it's, it's on all the major platforms. It's on, uh, you know, iTunes, uh, Spotify, you name it. Uh, uh, iHeartRadio, it's, it's everywhere. Anchor. Uh, I, I wish I had the whole list. So, you know, if you go to, if you go to Apple and, and just type in Sports Booth, you'll find it right there. And then the website is uh, sportsboothweb.com and take a look at both of them. You know, I haven't loaded up a ton of ads or anything on, on either of the sites. I got a couple on the Sports Booth web, but I didn't want to clutter it. I, I want it to be a resource for the kids. And if you have any questions, there's an email link uh, in uh, for both pxpquestions at gmail.com. I will personally answer any questions that you may have, uh, but I highly encourage everybody to use those, use both the pod and the web as a supplement to the instruction that you're getting in college. There's no doubt about it. And uh, again, Matt McConnell, ladies and gentlemen, the Fox Sports Arizona, Arizona Coyotes, play-by-play -play man, full-time man, uh, Matt McConnell. Matt, can't thank you enough for joining me here this evening, or in your case, afternoon where you are. <laughs> Uh, in Arizona. Really, really appreciate you taking the time out of, I'm assuming, a sunny, gorgeous day in uh, in steamy, hot Arizona. Every and, day. <laughs> there you go, right? Exactly. And uh, and again, we, we, you know, to to uh, to be able to join a, uh, a a great list, really, it's it's a great honor to have you on here on this show. Well, Joey, thanks a lot. This was a lot of fun. I, I think this is a great setup. The prime time rundown powered by StreamYard. I love it. I wish you well as, as, as uh, too in, in, in your search and your climb as a play-by-play -play guy. Uh, and if you ever want to do it again, just let me know. Matt, thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, uh, starting at 6 o'clock on Zingo Channel 198, it's going to be the K&K &K Sports Show, Wits and Wagers. We have run over a couple of minutes, but they will be starting right now.